May it please the court, counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. My name is Sean Wagner. I'm an attorney with Clearwater Business Law. I represent Clearwater Business Law and attorney Andrew Mongeluzzi, who is here with me today. Um, the case is styled in the name of Galinsky and the Galinsky entities, as well as Clearwater Business Law. But the final judgment that we're here today is only entered against Clearwater Business Law and Mr. Mongeluzzi. So, um, that's that's who I advocate for this this morning, and that's who I represent. <clears throat> the facts of this case. Hang on, sir. You're going to reserve some rebuttal. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Your Honor. Five minutes, please. Five minutes. Yes. Please. All right. Go ahead, please. Appreciate the reminder. The facts of this case, when you boil them down, are pretty simple. The case went on for about two years. Both sides made uh, significant accommodations uh, when it came to scheduling discovery depositions. Um, there were significant delays in the initial discovery deposition schedule due to the conduct of the appellee's counsel. Um, and I would note, and I'm sure the court has noted um, from our briefs, that Gina Miller uh, was scheduled for a deposition in November of 2020. Um, and the only reason Gina Miller's deposition was, re was not taken then from the record is that counsel for the appellees asked to move her client into that spot and quickly said for no re reason other than a scheduling uh, a scheduling uh, mix-up or a scheduling issue that... Uh, As you read the record in this case, it's abundantly clear there was a whole lot of back and forth between these lawyers. I need more time. You need more time. I'll give you more time. It's, it's exhausting, quite frankly, to read it. it is. I mean, it's like nobody was really serious about ever getting this case tried. It's the way I look at it. We see that a lot today. Um, but the bottom line is, at some point, a motion for sanctions was filed. Now, whether or not that was the most aggrieved party that filed it or not, that's an issue for another day. So all this back and forth stuff is interesting, but really irrelevant. The question is, there was a motion for sanctions filed. And your position is the court erred in granting that motion. Can we drill down on that? Yes, so the, the law is clear. Your honors, that you know, a sanctions motion, a sanctions order like this is a derogation of the common law. The common law, the American rule in, in our jurisdiction, states that the parties bear their own attorney's fees. So you've got to have an exception. The exception here was, was sanctionable conduct. So I think we need to look at this in the context of, 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 of an order that's in derogation of the common law. The, the, the sanction at issue involves the court's inherent authority to enforce its own orders. That's the, the Moakley case. Your Honor, that case is about 20 well, years. Moakley is not about enforcing its own orders so much as it's inherent authority to sanction for whatever reason, right? Correct. The, the, court's, the court's power to, to control the, the conduct of the litigants. And there's a reserve, last-ditch, Inherent authority, recognizing that the court is one third of the, the the government. The court is an independent branch of government, so the court has this inherent authority. But with that inherent authority comes a lot of uh, responsibility. Comes the the very very serious uh, issue of due process, and quite frankly, restraint and wisdom. And I don't think restraint and wisdom was used in this case. And well, I think it seems to me your argument was a due process argument. First of all, we didn't know this was coming. It is. And then second of all, I thought your argument was you didn't comply with the motion. You didn't make the findings. Does that sound familiar? I think I've heard that today. Yes. <laughs> so, so, the ar so, so the first argument, and, 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 and obviously the, the most important argument from our perspective, is that on November 17th of 2021, the court held a telephonic, non-evidentiary hearing on a motion for sanctions. The motion that was before the court was a motion for sanctions against defendants. And in that case, the defendants were Ryan Galinsky, Galinsky Tax Advisors, and Galinsky Tax Prep, LLC. Um, Mr. Mongeluzzi was not noticed uh, that he or his firm, Clearwater Business Law, was the subject of sanctions. So he sent an associate to the, to the hearing, um, not an evidentiary hearing. So let me get this right. A motion for sanctions coming down against his firm, and he sends... An associate it, it wasn't against his firm, it was against his clients. I mean, that's not really a legal issue before us, but it's a head scratcher. Um, well, it, yeah, I mean, I think, there's a, I think there's a fundamental difference, Your Honors, if you're going 
to send an associate to represent your clients, and she very clearly represents the clients, as opposed to if you think you're the target for sanctions. I, I think the point Judge Morris is making is when you get to the point where you're, your client and you're the lead lawyer representing this client is apparently facing the possibility of sanctions, that's the time the lead lawyer needs to show up and be the face, be the face of the client, and hold the flag, so to speak. I think that's the time I'll speak for it. I think that's the point Judge Morris is making. It's a fair point, um, you know, and I wasn't, I wasn't with the firm then. Um, you know, I, I can just tell you that I that there there are other issues that would be involved if if the lawyer, him or herself, is facing sanctions. That lawyer may actually want to uh, give the client some advice, um, maybe advise the client to retain independent counsel. That lawyer might want to retain his own counsel or um, at least make a, a more informed decision about who to send. So that's why the notice is important. Um, and notice wasn't provided here. No matter how you slice it, the, 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 the motion itself was against the defendants. There was no, and, and the case, Your Honor, that's right on point, Your Honor, that's right on point, is the Rufin case. That's a second DCA case where attorney Rufin was, uh, um, the motion was styled as a motion for sanctions against attorney Rufin's clients. And somehow after the hearing, she ended up being sanctioned under Mowgli and this court reversed on due process grounds. That's very uh, a very Why factual Mowgli's civil entitlement was um, determined early on at the initial hearing. It was revisited, right? It was not. It was so revisited at the rehearing? No. So what happened? I read, I read the transcript. It seems to be that it was revisited. Well, I would respectfully disagree and 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 I'll tell you why I would disagree. Um, what what happened was Mr. after Mr. Mongeluzzi read the transcript of the first hearing, he filed a motion for rehearing or reconsideration, asking the court to set to, to what he said in the motion was 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 conduct a proper evidentiary hearing. Mr. Mongeluzzi was asking for an evidentiary hearing. The court considered the motion, said, "I'm not going to reconsider my ruling," and. The motion, the mo I'm granting your motion for rehearing. I'm not considering my ruling. Essentially denying the actual request. The request was scheduled a full evidentiary hearing on the entitlement, and the court basically said no. Uh, I'm not going to reconsider my ruling, um, and never granted Mr. Mongeluzzi a, a full evidentiary hearing on entitlement. <laughs> then we get to the, the third hearing. That was the only hearing where there actually was what what we would consider to be a full evidentiary hearing where witnesses are sworn, cross-examination is allowed. And at that hearing, the court said very clearly in two places, Your Honors, one, at that point I was involved at the trial court level, and I was cross-examining counsel for the appellant, the court cut me off, just said stop, basically, and said, you know, I appreciate that you've gone down this road for a while, but again, today it's only about, um, it's only about uh, who pays and how much. That's, that's a paraphrase. That's not the most important statement the court made. The, when the court was ruling, Your Honors, the court said, this, and this is a quote, the underlying entitlement issue, though, is moot for today's hearing because that was already entered by the court earlier, even though it wasn't reduced to writing. So the, to, to respectfully, Judge Smith, to answer your question, we the court never conducted an evidentiary hearing on the question of entitlement. And if, if I could analogize it, a, a sanctions proceeding, which is just like a- That, that up until the point of the final judgment, there is, as much as everybody tried to get a written order as partial order, partial order was never entered on entitlement. Is that fair? A, a partial order, I don't agree with that. I think the judge had ruled. There is, a, there is a, an oral ruling. There's an oral ruling. The court, and there was a, a written order. There was a written order. On um, specifically the entitlement? On entitlement. It, it happened earlier yeah. in the case. Um, I, I don't, I don't have it. I can tell you that, that it was entered fairly quickly after, after the, um, um, November hearing. So that's my recollection. It's a big record. That's that's my recollection. Um, then on top of that, the, um, the the trial court really just rolled with the with the um, entitlement uh, ruling, wouldn't wouldn't hear evidence on entitlement, 
throughout the entire proceeding and then said, all right, now, now that I've done the evidentiary hearing on essentially damages, I'm going to find Mr. Mongeluzzi and his and certain clients. By the way, Gina Miller and Michelle Galinsky weren't weren't on the original motion either. So the original motion is against the defendants, which are Ryan Galinsky, uh, Galinsky Tax Prep, and Galinsky Tax Advisors, and the people who ended up getting sanctioned at the end of the day, even though Mr. Mongeluzzi uh, took took the sanctions from Galinsky and Miller, were people that weren't on the motion. That's the problem. Um, and what I what what I would suggest and what I observe at the end of the day, the sanctions were only against Mr. Mongeluzzi because he stepped up and said, "Don't sanction them, sanction me." Right? The, the, a portion of the sanctions were against Mr. Mongeluzzi that would have gone to Miller and Galinsky. What the court said is he would have sanctioned Miller and Galinsky, but the, and must Mr. Mongeluzzi and Mr. Mongeluzzi's law firm, but for the fact that Mr. Mongeluzzi accepted. Uh, the sanctions for Miller and Gal Galinsky 100% went to Mr. Mongeluzzi. We don't know what the percentage is. It's not really important from my perspective. But there is, it's clear by the court's ruling that Mr. Mongeluzzi was going to get sanctioned for some portion of that conduct. And the fact that Galinsky and Miller aren't here is because Mr. Mongeluzzi said, whatever percentage you're going to assign to them, uh, assign to me instead. And that's really where that went. So I'd like to focus in on one of the things that the court said very early on, and that, and that uh, um, the opposing party has, has focused on quite a bit, and that is that the court only made a finding of entitlement at the first non-evidentiary hearing and reserved two things for the, 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 the follow-up proceedings, how much and who paid. And I'd like to analogize a sanctions proceeding to any civil lawsuit. Let's call it a tort lawsuit. Can, can we go back a moment yeah. to the facts and, and um, address something I don't know that, that you've um, addressed? But there, the court seemed to take issue with the fact that this deposition um, was canceled because um, the attorney had another matter, okay, it had to prep for another matter. And, and, and that's why the deposition was canceled. I think the court focused on that. Yes, it did. Um, so, you know, and, and looking what, what was happening here, could, could the court not, based upon the statements of the, of the lawyers at that initial hearing, I mean, I, I, I kind of see what the court was doing. He's frustrated with what's going on. He hears from the attorneys. You know, they're telling the court what happened, and then you know, then comes the ruling on entitlement because there's an admission basically of what happened and why that deposition was canceled. Well, I would disagree that there was an admission because Mr. Mongeluzzi, I know this seems hyper technical, but it really goes to the heart of the due process problem. Mr. Mongeluzzi and Clearwater Business Law were not there, they weren't present. The, Okay, so, so but is that argument waived by the fact that at the end, when the sanctions are coming down, that they accept them? I mean, it's, I, I, mean, I understand that's the root of, of, of some of your issues here, but is that issue waived? No. Does he accept all the sanctions? No, he didn't accept all the sanctions. What, what he said and what the record shows is that the court specifically said, I would apportion that there's, that there's there's a pie. There's 100% of the pie. And the court says one slice is going to go to Mongeluzzi, a slice is going to go to Galinsky, and a slice is going to go to Miller. And Mr. Mongeluzzi said, without I, I without waiving my right to appeal this matter, I'm going to go ahead and take Galinsky and Miller's slice. Um, for you know, there's a variety of reasons. There, some of them are noble not wanting to put Ms. Miller through this, but some of them involve our ability to continue to litigate this without So the language is was uh, without waiving my right to appeal. It's in a footnote to our initial brief, Your Honor. And so um, it's a citation to the record? Yeah. I, I, if it's there, I, I, I accept that. Yeah, it's in a, it's a, I don't need you to take sure. Yeah, it's in a footnote to our initial brief, and it's got a citation to the record. And he was very clear that he didn't, you know, he said, look, I, I'll accept it, but I'm not waiving my, my, my right to challenge. On the issue of waiver and preservation of error, um, when there was a finding of entitlement and a non-evidentiary hearing, was that issue preserved? 
it is preserved, particularly on the due process issues, because the due, due process is reviewed under, under the fundamental error standard. So uh, preservation, um, I, Mr. Mondaluzzi objected at the first chance he had, which is when he filed a yeah, motion for rehearing. He said an associate was there. Right. So it was, it was preserved to the extent that Mr. Mondaluzzi filed a motion for rehearing and said, you can't do this, Judge. You can't sanction me. Well, motion for rehearing is interesting, but if there's not a timely objection, on the record, stating the basis for the objection. Preservation is a big issue because we are an error-correcting court. What we do is correct a mistake made by a trial judge, and if the trial judge isn't notified of that mistake timely at the hearing, the trial judge doesn't have an opportunity to address it, so there's nothing for us to fix. Well, I would agree with that, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not going to presume to ask the court questions, but uh, what I'm hearing might be, it might be suggested that, that Mr. Mongeluzzi should have objected at the first hearing, the November 17th hearing. And that's impossible when you're not physically there and you're not represented by counsel. You chose not to be there, right? And you are into your rebuttal time, just so you know. This is a very interesting dialogue. I hate to cut you off, and I'm not cutting you off. It's your time. You no, whatever you want. I would like to reserve rebuttal time, Judge, okay. so you I appreciate that. Good morning. May it please the court. I'm Shereen Vesley. I represent the FLE Florida Tax Advisors. With me is Shannon Gardner, who is a principal with Florida Tax Advisors. Thank you for your time today. Before you is the question of whether to reverse or affirm Judge Ramsberger's nine page order awarding attorney's fees and costs as a sanction against Mr. Mongeluzzi and his law firm. Under the facts and the law, we believe it should be affirmed. Well, let's, let's talk about the entitlement hearing that happened that has been challenged. Thank you. I mean, I mean, why shouldn't we overturn it on that alone? Really, an evidentiary hearing shouldn't have had, shouldn't it? No, Your Honor. And let me explain a few things. One is Judge Smith asked if a partial order was entered on entitlement. It was not. I don't believe Mr. Mag Wagner meant to misquote the record. There was not an order entered after the after that first hearing. In fact, um, Judge Ramsberger, in his order on his motion for rehearing, said this in his order: "The court will enter one order that encompasses all matters related to the requested relief of sanctions after a subsequent hearing, which will contain all necessary findings regarding entitlement." and determinations of who will be responsible to pay such actions and respective monetary amounts. It was understood that there was going to be one order at the end of all of these hearings, and that's what occurred. So at what point was there an evidentiary hearing on entitlement? There was an evidentiary hearing on entitlement at the final hearing on June 30th and July 1. And to answer Ms. Smith's other question, entitlement was revisited. And this is what Judge Ramsberger had to say about that during the hearing. He expressed that his previous oral pronouncement on entitlement dovetailed his pronouncements at the evidentiary hearing as required by Moakley. And he said, quote, so it's a blending of the last of the previous hearing on entitlement with today. Well, let, let, me, let me ask you this. Um, it, it does seem in, in reading the record, and I, I understand it wasn't a partial order entered because we all know what that means in terms of it's the order entered in that motion we hear in this denial. But entitlement ruling is, is still. Um, it's the same from the beginning that the court entered its oral ruling about entitlement. And then you go through the, you go through the transcript and you see the court say, okay, I've now been given more information. And the court says, well, you know, I want to make sure I'm thorough with my findings. But it doesn't seem to me that the court is um, open to changing its mind on entitlement. It seems that the hearing just more solidified that entitlement um, was right. But that said, at any given time, 
could the court have changed its mind on entitlement because we don't have an order? At any given time, the judge could have changed his mind. And I think if, if there's any error that might have arisen from the trial court's initial determination on entitlement only, it was certainly cured or harmless by the time we get to almost a year later from his first order requiring a deposition. It's almost a year later. We have a full evidentiary hearing, four and a half hours, where Mr. Mangaluzzi's eight-page affidavit with 47 exhibits is accepted into evidence, where he testifies, where I am cross-examined, where we each bring our experts and all documentary evidence that we want admitted is admitted, and the judge considers it. And he stated on the record that he considered it. And so I think what we have here is the trial court's acknowledgement at the evidentiary hearing that the issue of entitlement has dovetailed. That's exactly the term he used with Moakley. Um, and it shows that the tri trial court would have found entitlement anyway. And so we have cited the special versus West Boca Medical Center case, 160 Southern 3rd, 1251 Florida Supreme Court case. Harmless error occurs when there is no reasonable possibility that the error contributed to the verdict. He didn't enter an initial order on the November 17th hearing. These issues carried through and Mr. Montaluzzi got exactly what he wanted, a full evidentiary hearing on the issue of whether he or his firm should be responsible for sanctions. And then after we do all of this, what Mr. Mangaluzzi says is, if anybody's going to be sanctioned, well, first he says, nobody should be sanctioned. And the court in the hearing recognizes that. The court says, I recognize you don't want anybody to be sanctioned. Court, that's entitlement. But then Mr. Mangaluzzi says, if anybody's going to be sanctioned, it should be me. And then Mr. Wagner takes it further regarding who should be responsible. It's not just that Mr. Mangaluzzi should accept the sanction amount for everybody. They go so far as to say that the deponents are not responsible. Mr. Wagner says, quote, so judge, to clarify Mr. Mangaluzzi's position, and my position here today, is that Mr. Mangaluzzi doesn't believe that he did anything wrong. He believes he's solely responsible for what the court believes he did wrong, and he does not believe that Gina Miller and Michelle Galinsky had any role in any of the actions that caused the delay of the deposition. So yes, he is 100% responsible for the actions that you heard testimony about here today and the other deposition and the other hearing. What you heard was that they didn't even participate in rescheduling the depositions to not be in there. So they go even further than just say, we'll take the sanctions. They say that these people are, the deponents are not responsible. Now, I know your honors know there's no dispute. This is an abuse of discretion standard. Judge Ramsberger did not issue this nine page final judgment lightly. At the end of the hearing, he, his ruling went on for 13 pages based not only upon what he saw in the final evidentiary hearing, but his observations for this year long period regarding these depositions. And he put that in the order, he put that on the record. This final judgment was entered after three hearings and a fourth full-blown evidentiary hearing. After the court admitted every piece of evidence that was offered by Mr. Mangaluzzi and his firm. We do not believe it could be said that he abused his discretion. You've said that they've argued that they got ambushed by multiple sanctions. I'd like to speak to that. Please. They did not get ambushed, and I'll tell you why. Ms. Perry came to that hearing, and this is what she said, quote, I understand they seem to be asking for the law firm and the non-parties to be responsible. Now, why is it that she knew that 
we were asking for the law firm and the non-parties to be responsible because 24 times in the motion is Mr. Mongeluzzi's name. You cannot read that motion and think for a minute that the conduct we're, we're, we're talking about is not Mr. Mongeluzzi's conduct. He's mentioned in the motion 24 times and prior to the hearing, case law was submitted regarding an attorney's conduct and when an attorney should be sanctioned for his conduct. So she comes to that hearing knowing that that case was cited and after having read the motion. Not one time does she, does she say to Judge Ramsberger, we cannot have this hearing, we object, it needs to be evidentiary. And we know from the Levy versus Levy case, which we provided the court, our supplemental authority, you have to preserve that with an objection. If you don't object to it being a non-evidentiary hearing at the time, it's too late to do it on a motion for rehearing. It is true that the motion does not say Mr. Mongeluzzi and his law firm should pay sanctions. That is true. But what is also true is that when she came to court, Ms. Perry, she knew that we were asking for the law firm and the non-parties to be responsible. So what did the court do? The court said, we are going to determine who is to pay at a subsequent hearing. What does that mean? That means we're going to determine what that person did to warrant sanctions and who should pay. There's no question that there is an element of entitlement that has to proceed in a future hearing so that the judge can determine who should receive the sanctions. I'm in a position, I'm a, a plaintiff's attorney on the other side. I have no idea, nor am I permitted to know what communications Mr. Mongeluzzi is having with his client, with the two deponents who are also his clients, about why these depositions are not happening or why these delays are occurring. A final judgment on who should be responsible was absolutely required. The judge recognized that. And when Mr. Mongeluzzi comes with Mr. Wagner to that hearing, they fully recognize and took their opportunity to be heard. Um, you asked your honor if an evidentiary hearing was required. We don't believe an evidentiary hearing was required on the initial hearing on November 17th. We cite to the court the Marcellus versus Peterson case, 330 Southern 3rd, 573, 4th DCA case. There, the 4th DCA affirmed the trial court's determination on entitlement to Mobley attorney's fees and only reversed as to the amount because the trial court failed to hold an evidentiary hearing and make specific findings regarding hourly rate and the number of hours expended. So the part that was reversed was the court felt you needed testimony and evidence about what a reasonable rate was, reasonable number of hours, but not entitlement to sanctions under Mowgli. And that's, we have, we have better than that. Yeah, I say your further position is that that was ultimately heard and subsequent evidence. It was, it was. If there was any error there, which we don't think there was under the, the Marcellus case, but even if you could say there was, it was certainly cured and it was harmless. Let me shift gears. Yes, okay. please. So they have argued that it was an uh, error for the trial court to take judicial notice of its own observations from prior hearing. So First, that was waived. At the hearing, the judge said that he was taking judicial notice of the prior observations. No objection was made. That's number one. Number two, the court is always in a position to take judicial notice of what he observes during the hearings. Um, Let me ask you a question. Is it judicial notice or is it just sort of the human process of perceiving information based on, you know, seeing these things. I mean, is it really judicial notice? I don't think it is judicial notice because the court is always entitled to to take into consideration all of the proceedings before it. Remembering, remembering what happened in the last hearing. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And that's exactly what happened here. Judge Bramsberger, we had a hearing. It, it wasn't even about the depositions, but 
He had already ordered the deposition of Ms. Miller. It had not taken place. He couldn't understand why. I explained why. I said, we agree that Ms. Miller should have whatever accommodations she wants. We'll get a driver, just tell us who. Tell her exactly the place she wants to be deposed. Tell us where. You say she can't see well, tell us what font you want on the notice. I provided to Mr. Mongeluzzi ahead of time. Here's my draft notice. I wanna make sure that it's acceptable to you. No response, no response, no response. We happen to be before Judge Ramsberger. Judge Ramsberger, during that hearing, asked Mr. Mongeluzzi to go to his computer and pull out the notice. He takes all of this time. He doesn't agree right away that the notice is fine. He reviews it and then he says, this is fine. Of course, that's exactly what I was looking for in an email so we could not have any more delays about what the notice looked like. And that is when Judge Ramsberger tucked that away, remembered that as part of the conduct that we were dealing with respect to these depositions. Now, it became perfectly clear at the end of the, of, of the deposition of Ms. Miller why it took almost a year to get her in a deposition room. And here's what happened, and it's in the record. Ms. Miller, under their firm's name, filed an arbitration claim. It's Mr. and Mrs. Miller versus my clients. That arbitration claim was filed after his other client, Mr. Galinsky, was enjoined from bringing an arbitration claim. When Ms. Miller brings this That's arbitration claim, record. it is, okay. it is. When Ms. Miller brings her arbitration claim, oddly, she's seeking damages for Mr. Galinsky, Mr. Mongeluzzi's other client the other client that's been enjoined from bringing in arbitration against my client. So part of the question of Ms. Miller would be, why are you making a claim against my client in arbitration seeking damages for somebody else? Now, Ms. Miller was a, a customer of Mr. Galinsky. That's how they know each other. So I take her deposition and what do we learn? We learn she did not know that she was making an arbitration claim that sought damages for somebody else, Mr. Galinsky. She did not know she was a party to this arbitration claim. She thought she was just a witness. She did not know that this was something that was filed where she's a party claiming money against my client. She testified, my client doesn't owe her any money. After that deposition was completed, they dismissed Ms. Miller's arbitration claim. And so it became crystal clear after her deposition why all of the obstruction was there. They did not want her to testify and highlight the fact that she, her name was on an arbitration claim that she did not understand. She said under oath in her deposition that the first time she saw that arbitration claim was two days before her deposition. And of course, this is the deposition we had been looking for for many, many, many months. And they asked me in the final hearing, why is it that you believe sanctions should be uh, entered in relation to the Gina Miller deposition? And I testified. It's because I believed I, it was intentional and I believed that they did not want to see the Miller deposition see the light of day. And so that, that was such bad faith conduct. And we were already at bad faith conduct before we even got to that deposition. And there is no question in my view that Judge Ramsberger recognized the bad faith conduct and he was very thorough in his order when he explains the bad faith conduct, um, even under the Mowgli standard. Your honors, I, I don't know if you have any other questions, but I will say uh, in response to your initial question of Mr. Wagner, you mentioned it was a head scratcher as to why Mr. Mongeluzzi did not attend the November 17 hearing. What's also a head scratcher, your honor, is that there was no written response filed 
to the motion to com uh, motion for sanctions. Um, the other point I would like to make is that, and this kind of goes to Judge Smith's question, any potential error regarding the November 17th hearing or due process question, we believe is rendered totally moot when Mr. Mangialuzzi and his firm come to court during the evidentiary hearing and state they're going to take the fees. They're going to take the sanction, not the clients. And so I think they, I think they went so far as to waive that with the comments I, I quoted from Mr. Wagner earlier. Um, and that's all the questions I have on that or all the answers I have on that. But I would like to say, Your Honors, that um, we ask you to affirm Judge Ramsberger's ruling, and we also ask that you please find that um, appellate court fees should be entered in this matter um, and, and allow the trial court to enter those because this is just an extension of the conduct that my client has had to pay for. And unless there's any other questions, I think I'm, I'm done with my argument. Thank you. You have four minutes left. I think you heard from counsel's uh, able presentation what the problem is with honors. When did we get an opportunity to challenge Judge Ramsberger's personal observations? When did we get an opportunity to challenge these scurrilous and, and vicious allegations of misconduct with Ms. Miller? The, the record reflects the party who gets the microphone. And in this case, we didn't have the microphone because we didn't get an evidentiary hearing. I would have loved to know in advance that Judge Ramsberger was going to make those observations. There's no transcript. Um, so the best I could have done is called a witness, called anybody who was there, tried to find circumstantial evidence to make our point. But we didn't. We didn't get that opportunity. And Did you get the opportunity in the affidavit that was filed by Mr. Mitchell? Uh, well, we didn't know he was going to do it because he didn't do it until final judgment. So the affidavit came before the final judgment. I know, but what, tell me what what you were um, not allowed to provide in the affidavit. What we weren't allowed to provide in the affidavit is an opportunity to cross-examine witnesses, call witnesses, conduct a full evidentiary hearing. I, I don't interpret the law to, to... Okay, so based on what you're telling me, my... I correct my understanding that you put forth everything you needed in his affidavit? The affidavit was in support of a motion for rehearing. The motion for rehearing was asking for an evidentiary hearing. So it has to be considered in that context. Judge, give us an evidentiary, a full evidentiary hearing. We weren't expecting to be able, we, I don't believe that, that we were expecting that that was going to be our opportunity to have but an evidentiary hearing. Was on entitlement. The rehearing was asking for an evidentiary hearing on entitlement. And we, we were asking for an opportunity to do what we did in the final hearing, to present witnesses, to cross-examine the witnesses that were, that were against us. And I will say this again to the court. This is what Judge Ramsberger said when he was ruling at the final hearing on, on the issue. He said, the underlying entitlement issue, though, is moot for today's hearing because that was already entered by the court earlier, even though it wasn't reduced to writing. So if you're in a if you're in a hearing and you that's your first opportunity to present witnesses and and have a full blown evidentiary hearing on the issue of entitlement and the court tells you at the end of the hearing it's moot, then I don't think you've gotten full and fair due process. The, the due process is the is the opportunity to be heard and it's a meaningful opportunity to be heard and it's a meaningful opportunity to be heard before rights are decided and before rights are decided are during the the uh, entitlement hearing. You can't say that rights weren't decided. We would have challenged entitlement. And I'll tell you another thing we would have challenged. We would have challenged this idea that Gina Miller didn't know what she was signing. It's, it's a very selective use of her deposition. What, what also happened, Miss Miller, Miller is now in her late 70s, early 80s. While this was all going on, her husband, Michael Miller, died. Michael Miller signed the arbitration documents. Miss Miller said in her deposition, I'm not saying I didn't read it, but you know, I think my husband read it more carefully than I did. So it's entirely unfair now that Mr. Miller isn't alive and able to come in here and tell us what he understood about it to take Ms. Miller's con statements out of context and then try to make it look like bad faith conduct. And I'm not here to litigate the case on a factual level. 
I'm, the point I'm making is you're vulnerable to these kind of uh, skewed personal attacks when you don't have a full opportunity to be heard, a meaningful opportunity to be heard, and full notice of what's going to happen. And that's what happened here. We, we were always one step behind because we didn't know we were the subject for sanctions. You wouldn't tolerate it if a plaintiff in a tort case came in and person A was sued for tort. The court made a, made a partial judgment on liability. I'm going to find there was negligence here. Uh, we're going to figure out who pays and how much later. And then person B ends up who isn't even involved in the lawsuit when the liability finding is made, person so B ends up paying well, the damages more. You're well over time. I'm not trying to indulge you, hoping you'd wind it up, but you look like you're building up. So. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honors. I'm not going to lie to you all, this is very unpleasant case, and you get more and more and more of them. But I know they're not pleasant for you either. I know both sides probably didn't even want to come here today and argue this case. But I appreciate what you did. I'll help us sort it out. Okay. Have a good day. Thank you.